Now we're going to look at a different type of motion of a spring system. We're going to look at what's called free damped motion. So a visual representation would be taking your spring system that we had before with the spring connected to the mass, but now you have friction created by the fact that the mass and uh, the attached spring perhaps are in some type of viscous or some type of solution here. So there's going to be friction because of that solution or maybe some type of a pulley or like uh, you could think of a piston situation here where the mass is now connected to um, a device here that now is, is getting friction in this uh, somewhat cylindrical domain which may or may not have a fluid in it. So you could think of that sort of like a shock that you might have in your car. <clears throat> so in this case there is a damping force acting on the mass and the assumption is in this particular these scenarios is that it's proportional to a power of instantaneous velocity. But the convention that we're going to use is that the damping force on that mass attached to the spring will be a constant multiple of uh, dx dt, yeah, the, the rate of change of the, of the displacement of the mass. Um, so that's how we're going to represent that. So, so now there's this added um, term in the differential equation. So now from Newton's second law, mass times acceleration, representation of the movement of the displacement of the mass. Well, from Hooke's law and the fact that you have the weight of the, um, the, weight of the uh, mass has to be balanced against the restoring force, which we saw before, this was the term we had before when there was no damping. But now we are going to subtract off a no term minus beta dx dt for the damping effect. Um, the reason for the minus sign is that uh, that force, the added force, opposes the direction of motion, hence damping, slows it down, slows the oscillation down, so to speak. And here's a new constant. This will be our damping constant. Okay, so now let's rewrite this equation. Again, we have a new term for the damping effect. So if we write, write that, we would have uh, equation looks like this. Second derivative of the displacement plus now we'll have beta divided by m dx dt plus k over m, the spring constant. So you have a damping constant and a spring constant. That other times x equals zero. And typically this is written in a different form, again, to use particular coefficients that have meaning, physical meaning. We could rewrite this as the second derivative. That's usually written plus 2 times lambda dx dt plus omega squared, which we saw before, x equals 0, where the definition is that 2 lambda is beta divided by m. <clears throat> and what we saw before will represent uh, omega squared is k over m. may have been in the previous notes that I had omega equals k over m. It should be, we're, we're writing k over m as a perfect square. So it would be omega squared over uh, is k over m. So if we look at the auxiliary equation for this slightly more complicated linear second order, the auxiliary equation will be the form m squared plus 2 lambda m plus omega squared equals 0. And your roots for the auxiliary equation would be m1 equals minus lambda plus the square root of lambda squared minus omega squared. And the other one is the same thing. You just subtract the radical lambda squared minus omega squared. So you're going to get three cases of what the roots could be depending on what's under that radical. So the sign, S-I-G-N, of this term, this difference, lambda squared minus omega squared, will determine one of three cases. for the general solution. And we're just going to go through those cases and then show you physically what does that mean in terms of the what the damping is going to do to the system. 
Uh, let's start with the first case where it's actually equal to zero. Right? So we'll look at the case. Uh, we'll call this case one. This might be ordered a little bit differently in the book, but that's fine. Case one. We'll look at the, case, uh, uh, the situation that lambda squared minus omega squared equals to zero. This has a name. This is, uh, this is when your system is critic, what we call critically damped. All right. So in that case, the general solution for the displacement from solving that second order equation when you have a double root is x of t equals e to the minus lambda t times c1 plus c2 t, because we know that extra t term comes in. And if you were to draw just sort of a general description of what the system might do through time, if this is the displacement, x and the y-axis, it would start oscillating and then perhaps eventually settle down and stop. One way to look at the word critically is that it means that a slight decrease in the damping. In other words, you're damping the system and then you lighten up on it. So if you lighten up on the damping, so a slight decrease in the damping force results in, results in oscillations. So the way I've drawn it, it does stop oscillating. You see some oscillation and then it kind of peters out and the displacement goes to zero, so it stops. But if you were to decrease the damping force, it would probably continue to oscillate back and forth, back and forth, okay? So that's the key of the term critically damped, right? It's just at the point where the system doesn't oscillate, if you, if, assuming that's what you wanted to have happen. Second case, let's take the case where what's under that radical is greater than zero. This is called overdamping or an overdamped spring system. In this case, the general solution You have two real roots, so the general solution is going to be x of t will be e to the minus lambda t times the quantity c1 times e to this radical in the root in, in the exponent x uh, lambda squared minus omega squared. We know it's positive, so we'll get t there plus c2 times e to the minus square root lambda squared minus omega squared t. That's what the solution will look like because you'll have two different roots. Keep in mind, we could write this in terms of sines and cosines, because remember from Euler's formula, e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. Okay. <clears throat> but that won't be necessary in this case. Um, in general, the solution in this particular case, I might have to zoom out just a little bit here so you can see that. Yeah, that's what the solution looks like. If we were to draw a picture, for this particular case, if this is time and this is displacement x, you would see a very smooth, non-oscillatory behavior. It's eventually just going to dampen itself out. It's overly damped. It can't oscillate. So this is more, you could say, a smooth, non-oscillatory motion. You're absorbing everything in the system so that it just smooths out. No oscillating at all. If you overdamp the spring's not going to vibrate. It's not going to move up and down. The solution, the liquid in that solution for which the mass is suspended might be just too thick, right? So that would be an overdamped case. And then finally, the last case we want to consider, zooming in a little bit again, let's look at case three. You can imagine the third case has to be when what's under the radical is negative and this is called underdamped. And 
the roots for the auxiliary equation in this particular case because you're going to get complex roots you're going to have one of them will be minus lambda plus the square root and because we'll have to reverse the sign this is the positive result times i so we'll have omega squared minus lambda squared and the second root will be minus lambda minus this because you'll have a negative under the original root and so we're going to represent that as a positive value times i. That's why we switched the order. Okay. Then the general solution. We've seen this for second order constant coefficients, homogeneous case. When you have complex roots, you're going to get a solution in the form e to the minus lambda t times this quantity, some constant times cosine of that radical omega squared minus lambda squared t plus some other constant c2 times sine radical omega squared minus lambda squared t. Right? It's a little bit more complicated just because of the complex roots. And what this system looks like in an underdamp case would be the following. Let's suppose this is your system. This is time. This is the displacement. And let me draw what, uh, let's say this is what an undamped system would look like. Some nice oscillatory motion. So this will say is undamped and then show you what underdamping would do. Underdamping would mean it would still oscillate, but you would notice that the, the amplitudes are starting to get smaller and smaller. Okay, so what would happen is you'd have a system, and you could watch my pen. It would start acting like the original system, but it wouldn't go down as far, and then it wouldn't go down as far, and then it wouldn't go down as far, and you can see eventually what's going to happen is it's going to not oscillate. So this is underdamped. So one way of describing that would be this statement. You could say that the amplitudes of motion No, excuse me. Amplitudes of variation. That would be a better way of saying it. Amplitudes of variation converge to zero. As time goes to infinity. Okay. Again, what happens is the system would oscillate normally, and then you'd start noticing that it's not making the variations that it used to. The variations are starting to converge to zero, so it just slowly stops varying till it's going to stop. That's an underdamped system. In the next video, what we'll do is we'll do examples of three equations that satisfy each of these cases for free damped mass spring systems.